today on Rescue USA. Camp counselors have to think quick to save children's lives. Okay, we gotta get on stairs to get the kids. Something in me decided I needed to tell them we need to get down on our knees and cover our head. Marshalltown is coming back stronger than ever. Then, a fire threatens to change a university forever. When we got there, I noticed that there was a little bit of smoke coming out of one of the eaves. You have a short window, and then you risk losing your entire collection. We've got about three or four different locations that we're taking those books to. Just after 4 p.m. on July 19, 2018, a wedge tornado sliced through America's heartland. The deepest cut, Main Street, Marshalltown, Iowa. 22 people were injured, their town shredded, but their spirit is what helped them survive. And the young heroes that arose from the crisis came from the unlikeliest of places. Marshalltown is a small, rural community of 27,000 people located about 50 miles northeast of Des Moines in the heart of Iowa cornfields. Built on a love of family, baseball, and the pursuit of an honest day's work, Marshalltown is truly a slice of Americana. Every summer, Marshalltown has a day camp called Summer Blast. Each morning, parents drop their kids off at the historic Coliseum. When you drop your kid off somewhere, you don't always think you need somebody to take care of them, but you do. Fortunately, Summer Blast is run by dedicated camp counselors Alyssa and Deshana. But little did they know, what seemed like a typical summer day would change their lives forever. It started out like any other normal day. Went to the library in the morning, had fun at the library, came and got ready to go to the pool. No big deal. There's always a different day. You never know what you're gonna get yourself into, but it's so much fun. But as kids played at the local gym and people in Marshalltown went about their daily lives, the atmosphere was preparing for a violent afternoon. I don't know exactly what time it was, but I walked out and I saw the skyline and it did not look very good. Some of the other people in Marshalltown felt the exact same way. Sue Cahill, a teacher and city council member, lives downtown near the gymnasium where the Summer Blast Camp was in full swing. I was getting some beeps on my phone that there was some severe weather around. I'm pretty curious, like anyone else, I'm looking out my windows and I could see that the sky was very dark in the northwest part. When that happens, you don't get too excited because that's still pretty far away. There were multiple tornadic storms marching through central Iowa that day. A tornado is basically a rapidly rotating column of air which typically forms out of thunderstorms when warm, moist air collides with cool, dry air. The severity of tornadoes are measured on the enhanced Fujita scale from EF0 to EF5, the worst of which features winds beyond a devastating 200 miles per hour. Sirens went off, uh, then we had a couple of deputies, I think, were spotting it. Even though there were tornado warnings, as the Summer Blast Day Camp was coming to an end, parents were getting ready to pick up their kids from the Coliseum. We went to get some groceries before I picked her up. I didn't think it was going to be serious at all. And I just kept shopping because, you know, it's Iowa and you get them all the time. It never crossed my mind that we were going to have a tornado, ever. Tornadoes are fierce. When you hear a warning, it is imperative to take cover because it means that the tornado has been spotted and it's imminent. A tornado warning has been issued. Two tornadoes were captured on video. Local news was showing them. The tornadoes were heading in the direction of Marshalltown. First responders were preparing for the worst. We had our rescue gear ready along with the jaws of life and a few chainsaws. When disaster strikes and when terror is facing us, these first responders put their lives on the line for all of us. Each and every day, they do it without hesitation. Then, radar confirmed it. The closer tornado was going to make a direct hit on Marshalltown. So at that point, I scurried down to the basement. When I looked up, I saw clouds I'd never seen. They were racing back and going in a circle. 
With the tornado a few blocks away, camp counselor Alyssa quickly takes charge and ushers the kids to the safest place available, the basement of the Veteran Memorial Coliseum. Even when I was down in the basement, I didn't realize what was happen until Alyssa had ran down to like the top of the steps and she goes, there's a tornado. Just something in me decided I needed to tell them that we need to get down on our knees and cover our head. And right when they were done, the tornado hit. When tornadoes tear through an area, their force can destroy almost anything. All you could hear was upstairs is like the Coliseum roof getting ripped off. And after the tornado took out the spire of the courthouse, the tornado was gone. But it left behind epic devastation. You know, we just went in a reaction mode and just, uh, I know I grabbed a detector that went with me. We started, went right over, checking on people, make sure they're okay. While first responders were out trying to make sure all the roads were safe, Sue emerged from her basement. And I look outside and I, I could tell immediately that there were many, many tree limbs down. Even though she was only blocks away from the wrecked Coliseum, her home only had minimal damage. As Alyssa moved all the children out of the damaged Coliseum, Rusty Mason was left wondering if his daughter Emerson had survived. I hopped in my truck, headed for the Coliseum. I couldn't get there, so I parked three blocks away and just started running. As I got closer and closer, when you see the destruction, and you see the bricks, I found a group of people standing in the street, and I said, hey, does anybody know where the Summer Blast kids are? And uh, they pointed in a direction, so I started running for that direction, and that's when I saw her. And as soon as she saw me, she started running towards me, and I just gave her a great big hug and didn't want to let go. Seeing the parents embrace their kids was just something I'll never forget. I think the Summer Blast staff will always be heroes to me. Because of them, I have her. <laughs> they know that that hug, that that word of encouragement, that is the beginning of them rebuilding their lives. On July 19, 2018, Marshalltown, Iowa was hit by a tornado packing winds upwards of 114 miles per hour. Thankfully, no one was seriously hurt. Some parts of Marshalltown suffered only minor damage, while others were devoured. It was just amazing to me what I was seeing. I got to the courthouse and I realized the spire at the very top of the clock tower, it was gone. It was very surreal, no one just it's coming right in on top of you, right on top of downtown, which, you know, a lot of tornadoes hit towns, they hit the corners of them or the outsides and gets parts of them, but this one came right through town, right down Main Street. Weeks later, this tight-knit community has become even tighter, receiving overwhelming support from the entire state of Iowa. Now the reconstruction phase is underway and going strong. Marshalltown enlisted the help of a team of disaster relief and restoration specialists led by Sheldon Yellen, who's coming into town to check on the progress of Veteran Memorial Coliseum. We know that we will help rebuild these physical structures and the communities will bounce back because their congregating places are going to be alive and active again. We have gotten such support to restore our building that is a historical building in our community dedicated to the veterans. That means the world to us. This is our only city recreational facility. This is also where every summer we do a camp called Summer Blast and the Summer Blast kids were here. Any of the kids hurt during the? No. With an open roof and everything just tore it right off and nobody's hurt. Afterwards, I ran into a student of mine who was one of the counselors. She said, we kept them positive and kept the kids safe and calm. She was just like, I can't believe what we just went through. So it really, you know, for a 20-year-old to then have had that responsibility to take on and keep those kids safe, that was just amazing. That's the best in people. Yeah. That's when yeah. it comes out. 
You guys have done a terrific job here. And all the small acts of kindness and heroism that's taken place in every little corner of this city, I can only believe that this town is coming back stronger than ever. Our community has really come together to help fit the needs for those affected by the tornado. We have so many wonderful things that have been given to us, which is just a testament to the community of Marshalltown to rally around. I mean, we're one camp, but to see the support has been absolutely unbelievable. The rebuilding process has begun, both physically, as you see here, and emotionally, as these people that we've seen here today and, and have talked to today have shared with us. And they know that this town is coming back. Despite all of the physical damage, no lives were lost that day because the community was ready and they had a plan. Marshalltown wasn't broken on July 19th. It was strengthened and united. Many people found their inner hero that day, and it's the resilient spirit that will lead Marshalltown to an even better tomorrow. Kansas State University's iconic Hale Library is home to more than one and a half million books, many of which are irreplaceable. It's the center of academic life on campus, so when a fire broke out inside the library, the faculty and students feared their campus would never be the same. Kansas State University. It's striking royal purple branding, a badge of pride for many in Manhattan, Kansas. With a student body just over 18,000, the university accounts for almost a third of the local population. On any typical Tuesday afternoon, you can find the students catching up with friends in the student center, grabbing a bite to eat in the cafeteria, or more often, cramming for a test at the Hale Library. It's a very large five-story building with beautiful limestone. It's centrally located and it's always been called kind of like the heart of campus. So students come in here all the time between classes to study or do research. That summer, Hale Library was undergoing repairs to its roof, but the construction process to install a new roof created a scenario that would change Hale Library and its 1.5 million books forever. On that day, May 22nd, I was actually working on campus over in Fairchild Hall, so I was just a couple buildings away, and I started getting the alerts on my phone. There were a lot of false alarms before, and so I didn't think anything of it. But there was enough smoke to alert the first responders. Veteran firefighter and Kansas State alum Jason Hudson answered the call. When we got there, you couldn't see much from the outside, but. I noticed that there was a little bit of smoke coming out of one of the eaves, and I could smell it. Definitely had a structure fire smell to it. There was just this really light gray little pillar of smoke coming out of the great room, and it didn't really look like anything. I am a pretty optimistic person, so I was thinking, OK, it's really isolated. Hopefully, it won't be too bad. But after first responders cleared the library of students and staff, they couldn't find the actual fire. We were going through several feet of roofing material with chainsaws and rotary saws trying to find the fire. Given the right conditions, structure fires can rapidly spread. With every passing moment, firefighters knew this fire was growing and the library's impressive collection of 1.5 million books was at risk of being destroyed. We knew that it was bad when I was inside. Completely zero visibility all throughout that massive structure. It took crews over two hours to locate and finally contain the destructive fire. Sadly, by that time, much of the library suffered significant smoke and water damage. The Hale Library was a shell of what it had been just hours before. It was pulling at my heart knowing how bad this was. There was not one square inch of the library that didn't have some sort of either soot or water damage from top to bottom. Although they saved the library, the contents weren't out of danger yet. Mold would start growing in days due to the high heat and high humidity. It's like 100 outside, and it feels like even hotter inside the building than it is outside. You have a short window between high humidity and high temperature and water before you risk losing your entire collection. A disaster restoration team was brought in to handle the enormous job of bringing back Kansas State's magnificent library, and more importantly, salvaging its precious contents. 
but we put three or four different plans of attack to focus on the things that we need to deal with in a hurry, and that being the books, getting the water out, and, and getting the building materials out so we could try to prevent any further damage. But it's a huge job, and it will require everyone's effort to preserve the collection. I would wake up at night. Am I advising people to do the right things? Is this the good thing for the collection? Trying to make sure everything's going as well as it can. It's been several weeks since the fire annihilated the Hale Library on Kansas State University's campus. More than 1.5 million copies of books and priceless special collection items had to be removed, dried, and cleaned up. With a tremendous amount of work to be done, the student body and faculty wondered just how long they'd have to wait for the library to be restored. We won't be able to access these books until this building is put back together again. But how do you restore 1.5 million books all damaged by smoke, water, and mold? We've got about three or four different locations scattered from Kansas City to Junction City that we're taking those books to to have enough space to store them until the rest of the library is put back together. And with the risk of mold, it's very important that they can control the humidity and temperature during the entire process. And the solution is not what you might expect. We're 10 stories underground. This was an old limestone mine. It's pretty neutral as far as humidity and climate. It doesn't fluctuate, and so it's just very safe storage in a climatized environment. This is where they clean the books. They vacuum first, and then they chem sponge all the way around, inside and front and back covers. And then it goes over into the ozone chamber and it spends the night over there. The ozone chamber removes the smoky odor, which can stain the paper indefinitely if not treated. So these are the books that will be ozoned tonight. We close the flaps on the air conditioning units and just close everything down. The gas will fill this chamber and then it will settle down inside the books. And then in the morning, we come in and we spot check with sponges. We seal them up and take them across to the other side and store them in a clean room over there. I really enjoy working Kay. I trust that she knows what she's doing with her job and that she values our collection and that we're in good hands with her. During the fire, many books were left in standing water from the sprinklers. When we get wet materials, we put it straight to a trailer where it's set at zero degrees, and we hold it there until we get the trailers full. Then it goes to Fort Worth, and it goes in a freeze-dry chamber, and that chamber puts it in a dry state, and then when the books come out, they're completely dry. While Kay was saving all 1.5 million books, the other crew was repairing the library. The fire was basically underneath that big white box that we built to try to protect the area, keep the, the weather from coming in. Because of the delay in discovering the exact location of the fire, the sprinkler system ran for several hours, which did significant damage to the walls and the contents of the library. We turned to you know, determining what parts of the walls were wet. They've got the great room that has some murals that we're working on saving that were painted directly on plaster, which was right above the fire. So that's another thing that's really important to the university is to try to save that, put that room back the way that it was before the fire happened. After months of not knowing if their library would ever be the same, students and faculty realized that their beloved library would soon be restored back to its former glory. This turned into what I thought was like an enormous tragedy and a really huge loss into more of like this is an amazing opportunity to really rethink, you know, how does a library work? What could go in it? How could it serve students even better? It takes an army of workers and a lot of people with a lot of heart to get this thing done. Books are part of us. They have all our ideas, our thoughts, our hopes, our futures are all embedded in those pages. Missing that would be missing a huge part of ourselves. Today, we've seen the incredible spirit of unsung heroes come shining through. In so many disasters, we learn about the victims, but we don't get to know the heroes. I am so grateful we got to celebrate the hero stories and can't wait to do it again with all of you.